Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully this is working, and hopefully I'm on time because uh, because I'm using my phone to do the filming, and uh, it also happens to have my watch on it. So it's uh, it's kind of dangerous that I don't have a watch. Um, we don't we don't want to preach for too long or teach for too long, but I, I don't have a watch. In my, so if I go too long, just uh, make a comment and say say, that's good, you're done, uh, good to see everybody. Uh, I am Brother Mike Temke, if you don't know me, and uh, I pastor here in Rancho Cordova, uh, which is just outside of Sacramento. Oh, we got a message from Santino and it said, okay, you good, we good, everything looking good? All right, all right. Sorry, uh, I'm not, I'm doing this all by myself. My, uh, no tech guys, just me, and hopefully the audio is good, and everything is working well. I, my, I am over 40, so my eyes can't quite see the comments on there, but, uh, but it looks like everything's well. Anyways, happy Easter to everybody. It is an honor to be able to be your online evangelist. I know this is different, and it's as different for us as it is for you at home, uh, but we're rolling with it. And we believe that God knows how to navigate through, uh, through the most uh, different and awkward circumstances in order to accomplish his will and, uh, and his purpose in the earth. And he is not hindered by any situation. As a matter of fact, he's leveraging the situations that are at hand. I've got my little pulpit here and I got my borrowed Bible that is really small print because my Bible is over in the other sanctuary and I didn't have time to go get that one. Not thinking that again, my phone, it was not going to be uh, accessible. So let's read this scripture and move this on. Appreciate your pastor. He is, he is my very good friend and, uh, and uh, all of you, congratulations on the Kendricks having a brand new baby. I had to shout that out there. All right. I know it's Easter and I, I, I kind of like to preach sermons and messages in accordance to whatever's going on. We might be a little bit on Easter, but we may not be. I felt like the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night uh, and was talking to me about a couple things, and I think we're going to have a good time. I'm going to be brief, and we're going to pray, and God's going to minister to us and to the church today. Chapter 3 of the book of Colossians says, If you then be risen with Christ, if you then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Amen. Let's pray over the word of the Lord. Everybody, right where you are, pray for the preacher and pray that we can hear from God today in Jesus' name. God, we pray in these uncertain times and all the things that are going on, and all the changes and the things that have placed us out of our comfort zone naturally. But God, you are our comfort zone. It is your spirit that provides us the confidence and the strength and the faith to be able to go forward into your will, into your purpose. I'm praying today for each person who is watching. I'm praying today for the church. I'm praying today for the leadership. I'm praying for the families and for the kids. I'm praying, God, that you, for the communities and for the people that uh, our churches are reaching and that uh, the new people that are coming in, the people that are connecting in different ways. I'm praying today in the name of Jesus that you utilize these moments in order to bring, bring vision and to bring uh, inspiration and to bring encouragement. I'm praying right now in Jesus' name that you would accomplish your purpose through all the obstacles in this hour and in this moment, and that you would shine your glory into the lives of men, that you would reach into homes, into people, into situations, that you'd be able to minister and bring people unto you, and closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody say amen. You can just type it in there and say amen. That way we know you're watching. Sorry, I tend to goof around a little bit. Uh, the, the Bible is very clear to teach us about different seasons. In the natural, we have four seasons. We have the winter, the spring, the summer, 
and the uh, winter, the spring, the fall, and the, let's do this in order. The winter, the spring, the summer, and the fall. The fall being the harvest season, the spring being the planting season, the winter being a season of waiting and trial, and the summer being also a season of waiting and trial. If you will, there's two positive seasons in which there is a lot of uh, obvious activity, and then there's two negative seasons, at least in our uh, perception, that are a little more of a struggle. I personally uh, enjoy the spring and the fall here in Sacramento. Uh, it's uh, the nice times of the year. The summer gets a little hot, just like where you're at. The winter gets a little cold, and for my flesh at least, I enjoy those two seasons and, uh, and what they bring. But the Bible has more to do with those seasons than just uh, our personal comfort. There's a message behind them. And each, uh, each time that, that the harvest is going to come, the natural season of summer uh, always precedes the season of, of harvest or the season of fall. And summer is not the uh, same as a winter season. Sometimes we're, we're feeling like we're in a winter season, but we're not. We're actually in a summer season. A season of waiting, or a season of uh, a season of weariness, a season of uh, of heat, and a season where uh, where things are not necessarily the way we want them to, de to be. A season of pressure, and wherever you find uh, harvest, you're going to find a waiting season before you find that harvest season, and the. Uh, it was such that in the Bible, each time that God was about to do something where his hand reached into the world, where he began to deliver through a Red Sea, or he began to take people into a promised land, or he began to uh, bring the ministry of Jesus Christ upon the earth to change the world and turn it upside down. Before each of those great harvest seasons, when the four months was up and the seed was ripe, ready for harvest in the time of Christ. And then when the season of, uh, of the children of Israel was going to recognize the promised land and they were going to realize the promises that had been promised all the way back since Abraham, that they were going to lift off the page of the book and no longer just be an ideal, but they were going to be realized and, and backing up farther in the season where Moses was going to be the great deliverer, each of them was uh, preempted by a season of summer, or the Bible will say a desert, which is a type of the summer season, or a wilderness, which is the same as the desert. Moses had to spend his time in the wilderness before he could enter into the season of doing what God had called him to do from when he was born and before he was born. He was going to realize his great calling and purpose and going to be the deliverer. But before that, 40 years in the backside of the desert. A long, hot summer. And then, uh, and then there was uh, the children of Israel with their promises that had laid latent upon the, the uh, pages of their scrolls and had been given to Abraham. And now they are finding themselves in such a place that they are not realizers of the promise. They're just a bunch of slaves. But God says, I'm about to move you into a harvest season. I'm about to move you into a season where promises that have been there for a long time, that have been seeds that you've been waiting to realize, that you could be the person you're supposed to be and do what you're supposed to do and dwell in the promised land, the land of milk and honey. It's about to happen. But first, we're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness and have a long summer season. And the same before Christ came to turn the world upside down, before Jesus Christ began to take the promises that had laid for generations, that one day broken hearts would be healed, that one day prisons, spiritual prisons would be liberated, that spiritual blinded eyes would be opened, and that, and that he would bring comfort, and he would bring peace, that he would become that Prince of Peace and fulfill all the scriptures that had been been sitting there and waiting a day to come to life. And so Jesus said, when he first uh, preached, he said, uh, Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Lord has enough. I'll just pretend I'm reading it. I, I actually know it. 
Um, but, you know, I'll open this up so it seems, you know, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel of the good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up or to heal brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the loosing of the prison, to them that are bound, and to comfort all that mourn. He closed the book, and they looked at him, and they said, what's he doing? He said, well, this has been in the book a long time, but we're going to take it out of the book, and we're going to walk it down the street today. We're going to take it out of the book, and we're going to see this come to life today. So Jesus brought the promises that had laid there for so long, and he, and he brought them into harvest. But prior to that, he had to go for 40 days into the wilderness, into the summer season. And, I, and that's not really the, the entirety of my message. I just wanted to lay the foundation that I feel like as a church we've been sitting in the summer season uh, and it's been a little bit hot, and it's a little been a little bit weary, and it's been a little bit long and a little bit arduous. It's a nice big five dollar word, arduous. And it seems like everything's a little heavier than it should be, and it seems like everything's a little harder to accomplish because of the weariness that comes. But of course, he said, "Don't be weary in a well doing, for in due season you will reap." If you faint not, the fainting season is the summer season. And so the fainting season has come and it has worn on us. But uh, it is only a sign that uh, we are about to enter into a harvest season. And I'm not the kind of guy just, to, just to, to throw it out there to make someone feel, oh, I'm so excited. I truly believe that the shifting in our world that we're seeing now is a shifting into harvest season. I really believe that. It's shifting into a season... That the promises that we already have in the book and that we have prophetically will become something that is not just a dream, but it's something that's a realization. Can I get a virtual amen? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for, thank you, you may, you may be seated. <laughs> uh, but there's always that last uh, turn of the corner, uh, that last... Uh, part of the season, that last week, that last point, that there's a tendency that the weariness or the sorrow of the moment would uh, discourage us, or more than discourage us, would cast our vision downward, would cast our faith downward. The Bible says that the foolish son sleeps in the harvest. There, uh, there is a, a particular word associated with prayer in the teaching of Jesus Christ that I, I never really noticed until God began to deal with me about it recently. I, I, I guess I noticed it, but he brought it to my attention that consistently when Jesus was, uh, was teaching and, and admonishing to pray, he, he consistently brought this idea in. And that was the idea of watch and pray. As a matter of fact, there's a couple times that he didn't even tell them to pray. He just told them to watch, which to us is strange. And I uh, looked it in. I, I looked into the Greek, thinking it's going to be something really cool, and it really just meant watch. But the, but it also had an idea of being awake. Now let's uh, let's move into a scripture in the Bible or a story in the Bible. Uh, the prayer of Jesus in the garden is where you find this. And uh, he's, he's going up and he's announced that it's going to take a turn, that he's no longer going to be with them. They don't quite understand, but they understand he's prophesying that he's going to die. He's prophesying uh, that things are going to... Uh, things are going to change and uh, they're not comfortable with it. It becomes a season of sorrow. It had been a long year. They had moved from their season of uh, uh, the, the year of popularity of Jesus Christ into the year of persecution and no longer were they uh, the popular crew. They were now uh, under a lot of pressure and uh, so Christ had taken them and brought them over to the Garden of Gethsemane. He let the others stay back, and he brought Peter, James, and John, and said, we're going to go up this, this side of this mountain, and I want you to watch and pray. Uh, and in a sense, he's saying, I want you to 
pay attention. I want you to be aware of the moment. Because you can pray in a religious sense and you can go through motions of prayer but I want in your prayer you to be attentive to the things that I am doing in your life and in the world I want you to have a awake prayer and uh, that's what he told them and yet uh, as Jesus was praying the most monumental prayer as he was saving the world as they got the opportunity to be audience to the uh, what could be considered the greatest moment in history, that the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, that that ball was, began rolling in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the greatest prayer, the prayer uh, that, that, that is the foundation of all prayer, not my will, but yours be done, was being prayed, and they fell asleep. And the Bible said, and this is strange to me at first, but I, I think I understand it more now, especially in the context of our certain of our current generation, they slept because of sorrow. He had admonished them to stay awake or to watch, to stay alert. And yet a fogginess and a weariness came over them because of the sorrow that they were dealing with. Now, let's back it up a little bit. Um, they should have re it should have been like Christmas morning for them. I say that because there's two other times in the scripture, particularly that we know of, that Jesus singles out Peter, James, and John and takes them on a special trip. First one is to the house of Jairus, where they get to witness Jesus raising a 12-year-old girl from the dead. And on the way, just as a little like addendum, like a little you know tip, a little bonus, we're going to heal the woman with the issue of blood, and, uh, and then we're going to get to this house. This, this little girl's going to be dead. Yeah, and you got to imagine... Being able to be an audience to that was an incredible thing. They got to see the mother and the father rejoicing and just the emotions of raising this girl from the dead and seeing the power of God. And they got singled out as those Peter, James, and John, those three, got to go into that place. And then later on, they get singled out again said, all right, the rest of you can stay back. Peter, James, John, we're going to go up a mountain. And they go up that mountain, and we call that mountain the Mount of Transfiguration. Almost couldn't pull that word off. Transfiguration. They called it the Mount of Transfiguration. On the Mount of Transfiguration, they literally got to see uh, Moses. They literally got to see Elijah. The law and the prophets were, were testifying of Jesus Christ. It was monumental. They were singled out and brought up, and they got to see the glory of God. They got to... Uh, enter into a place where their faith was lifted and experienced that would, that would, that would change them forever. And so uh, that was the last time that they had been invited to go up a mountain, just the three of them. So you would think that at this moment, this hour, that, that they're, oh, here we go again. We get to go up the mountain again, just like last time. And maybe we're going to see Moses, or maybe we'll see Abraham this time. I don't know what's going to happen. You think it would be like Christmas morning. Oh, my goodness, we're going up the mountain. But it wasn't like that. And it is in the moment where God is taking you up a mountain to, to begin to allow you to realize promises that have laid latent in your life for for years, it is at that moment that you are about to realize harvest, that Pentecost is around the corner, and, and the 3,000 being baptized is just a couple weeks away, and, and the world being turned upside down. You're right on the cuff of it. You're on the cuff of being able to allow these signs to follow them that believe, and that in his name you'd cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, they recover, that the things that he did, you would do also. And in that very moment, you get sleepy because of sorrow. In our world, um, in our equation, we equate sorrow as something very negative. In our world, it is something that is an obstacle. In our human flesh, sorrows of all kinds, just the heaviness of anxieties and limitations and disappointment and sorrows that are large like mourning and death and sorrows that are small like stress and anxiety and, and everything in between. We look at them as an enemy. We look at them as something 
uh, that is going to hinder our purpose. But it's always since the foundation uh, of God's dealing with man, it, it has, sorrow has not been the obstacle. Sorrow has been the pathway to birth. In our world, sorrow is an obstacle. In the kingdom of God, sorrow is what precedes birth. He said, uh, we're going to go ahead and have a world, Eve. We're going to go ahead and you're going to have children. And you're going to fill the world and accomplish this purpose and be fruitful and multiply. But you're going to do it from a foundation of sorrow, Eve. Out of sorrow, you will have children. And... Uh, and I know that's commonly understood now, but this was news to her. So the seasons of sorrow is going to come, Eve, but don't, don't let it discourage you. Because it is just a sign that you're about to have a child. And once you've gone through that, you'll know how this works. And he turns to Adam and he says, Adam, out of the sweat of your brow, uh, sweat of your face, you're going to have a harvest. It's going to be painful and you're going to... You know, hit, you're going to step on a rake, it's going to hit you in the face. You're going to, you know, step on a pickaxe and it's going to be, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be some sorrow involved, some sweat involved. But understand this, that is my process. I always have a night of weeping, a night of sorrow that, that forecasts or that brings forth the joy in the morning. And I know that that is a simple principle. But what we have to be cautious of is the fact that in that sorrow, it's so easy to fall asleep and not to watch, not to all of a sudden awaken to the fact that, oh, it might feel heavy. It might feel like I'm walking up this mountain with Jesus and, and he's, he's in heaviness of spirit. But this is the moment. I understand that from this moment, we're going to see a resurrection. And if I am going to be risen, then I've got to lift my eyes from the natural perception and thinking, oh, well, look at all this, look at all that. And to the spiritual perception and say, from this night of sorrow, there's going to come a morning of joy. From this, uh, this long season of planting, there's going to come a good season of reaping. My eyes might have to awaken to my spiritual a looking of things above risen perception and say, hey, this is the moment for, for the church. This is the moment for me to see the promises that have been uh, promised me come and become mine. Amen. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Just press the little, you know, you can press the little like, like button on there. <laughs> Amen. And so, uh, Peter, James, John, going up uh, the mountain with Jesus Christ, and they're competing against the sorrow. Sorrow has two things that it can do to us. Thank you for all those amens. Um, it can put us to sleep, or it can wake us up. And I believe that there's an awakening in the in the season of sorrow, there's an awakening that will cause us to uh, cause us to become possessors of the promises that God has given us. Because uh, you know, I mean, how many of us have been in that place that you have a prophecy, a promise, and the word of God, or from a prophet, or uh, a time of prayer? And yet you feel so unworthy of that. You feel so far from that. And uh, I, I always tell, I tell some of the folks in my church, look, don't send me a picture of you barbecuing a tri-tip and, and just, just show me that you're barbecuing a tri-tip. I said, if you're going to send me a picture of your dinner, invite me. Because I don't want to hear about your tri-tip. I don't want to hear about the great meal you're having. I want, I'm like, hey. Yeah, you know, I am home eating, you know, cereal, and you're, and I want an invitation. I want it to be mine. Uh, I, maybe that's selfish, but I'm on, that my, my church jokes with me about it because they know, hey, like, if you're going to send me a picture, you better send me an invitation because I, I, I don't want to just see something that I can't have. I want to realize something. And we can get so frustrating having promises and all these things, but we feel like we can't put them in our pocket. But this season that is so uncomfortable and so disjointed. And, uh, and the Bible says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that come to try your faith as though some strange thing has happened to you. What's that mean? That means that it doesn't, trials don't always seem like trials. 
They don't always, you know, we don't always perceive it. Oh, this is that. This is the birth pains for me to be able to become who I am supposed to be, for new life to be, oh, I see that. We don't always see it. We count it as a strange thing. And, and, and in our current climate, we're looking, we're saying, oh, this is a strange thing. This is, this is tough. I don't like this. I'm uncomfortable with this. I, I wish I didn't have these limitations. And we're not necessarily equating it to these are the sorrows that are going to bring forth the birth. These are the birth pains that are going to bring forth spiritual life, spirit life, a new consecration, a broadening of prayer or communion with God to where we we acknowledge Him in all of our ways, not just on Sunday, not just in a certain form of worship, but when we wake up on Monday and on Tuesday, when we're at the market and we're here, we're there, we're in our homes, there is an awareness and an abiding and remaining in Christ that is born out of this season of sorrow, a broadening of prayer, a watchfulness to where we begin to watch and, and be attentive to what God is doing and so consequently we're led more. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? We're led more because, because not just on Sunday, where I've leaned heavy on Sunday and just, and just got so used to being in the Holy Ghost on Sunday, I don't know what it's like to be the Holy Ghost at the hardware store. But where, where I, I've allowed this sorrow season and its complexity to stretch me and to make me to be aware of Christ because there is a leading in all of my paths that is promised me as long as there's an acknowledging in all my ways. There's a directing in all my paths that's promised me when there is a acknowledging in all of my ways. I had to say that twice. I wasn't just being like old. I was actually saying that on purpose twice. That, I, that, that I, I'm not just a Sunday acknowledger. And I, and I don't want to mean to just, just harp on that. But I just know how this works. I know how easy it is to stop watching. Stop watching for the will of God and the move of the Spirit when we're just living life. And yet Jesus said, uh, and so many times in, in the book of Mark, he says it this way. He says, look, the master house comes. Don't let him find you sleeping. But I say unto you, watch. And he says, I say, he says it like this. I say unto you and I say unto all, watch. Look, be awake because the hour is upon you. The moment is there. The opportunities are right there. Don't let the sorrows put you to sleep. Let them wake you up. Amen. It's our choice. It's our choice, and, and we can feel the pull in both directions. We can feel the pull to be carnal and to kind of give up in some senses, the pull to be depressed, the pull to be despondent. We can feel the sleepy pull of sorrow. At the same time, we're feeling the pull to pray. We're feeling the pull to broaden our prayers and begin to include God in such a greater uh, uh, parts of our life and to constantly keep our mind on him. We're feeling the pull to deeper prayer where, where we spend some serious time with God. And we can feel both poles. And, and uh, Judas to answered one pole. And the, and the disciples they didn't even didn't handle the pole all that well. But, but there came a day that they were awake to the will of God. And I want us to be awake to the, to the will of God and the coming harvest that he has for us. I want us to be prepared. Because I believe God is going to reap a great harvest upon the earth and bring a great awakening. And I want to be a part of that. And I want my sorrows and frustrations, little, complex, uh, things that don't look like trials, I want them to awaken me into the place and so that I can, I can be who God has called me to be in this hour. Amen. Let's pray. I have no idea how long I, I preached. I have no idea. apologize if it was too long. But I, I want to pray for us all today. Because I believe we sit at a crossroads. And, and we're in a season of pressure and all that. And we can go two directions. There's going to be a group of people that are going to awaken as they climb their mountain. And they're going to see the glory. They're going to awaken Amen. And, and, and partake of the, and see the process of not my will, but thine be done. The crucifixion, the resurrection, and Pentecost. And they're, gonna, they're going to be awake and alert to all of that and watching uh, and watchful of what the leading of the Spirit is. And there's another group that's just going to have lost their religious form, lost their, their, their crutch, lost their, 
uh, lost uh, what was easy, and they're just going to flow down into carnality and sleep away. And I want to be sure that as many of us as possible can be there to realize the harvest for the laborers are few. Jesus, God, today. Oh, God. This is the moment, God. We are in this, this, this strange moment of time. And there's change of foot, and there's a move of the Holy Ghost. There is a drawing, God, into a deeper communion, a deeper and broader communion with you. To prepare us with sickle in hand, to prepare us, God, to be led of the Spirit into great harvest. To make us the ones that know where to throw the nets into the, into the waters, God. To lead us to cast the line to the fish that has the coin in its mouth. To lead us to people that are hurting. To give us, lead us to words of wisdom, God. To lead us to places of consecration and dedication. Not out of some religious form, but as we are called of God to do so. Because you said, my people, they know my voice. There is a leading and a guiding into all truth. There is a leading that is available for us, God, in such a mighty way, not reserved to preachers alone, not reserved to the super spiritual, but you're calling your body to come together and awaken to your voice that wants to lead us into the green pastures beside the still waters and to restore our soul. I pray today in Jesus' name that we answer that call of your spirit that we answer the leading of the Holy Ghost and do not let the sorrows and the long summer heat put us to sleep that we do not allow the long sorrows of the summer heat to have put us to sleep right before the harvest but that we arise awaken and do the will of God I believe it today in Jesus name amen I'm worshiping Jesus I love you so much Thank you, Lord. We love you so much. Again, thank you, everybody, for having me as your guest. And we'll, uh, we'll see you soon.